So here we left off the DCF of Walmart. I want to now complete it by adjusting the level of the wax. So when I mentioned that I thought that 10% is too high, knowing a little bit about the risk pure rate, why would I say that? What I said that looks a little high. What could that be based on? What can you guess? What are the major variables? What are the major drivers of the weighted average cost of capital? What's an obvious first one that would bring that down? Cost of debt. The cost of debt was what? Four percent from long-term debt. 8% for the capital leases, but the long term debt was the bulk of it. So cost of debt should, should bring that down. So if it's not for cost of debt, the only thing that could keep that high is the cost of equity. Cost of equity is based largely on what? The market risk premium and the company's beta, which is based on what? Correlation returns to the overall market. Yep, meaning what? The return. Say again? So typically a big company like Walmart is highly diversified, you're going to have a pretty low beta, it's at least going to be aligned with the market. So. Because it has low risk. Risk, because it has low volatility. Or low volatility because it has low risk, maybe that's the way. But okay. <laughs> What's that? I said we did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's I mean, basically let's just start plugging in some of the some of the important pieces. But I want to show you where I would get them. The risk-free rate comes from the Treasury rates. So um, if we're pulling up the engine, I want to show you. First, let me show you. Um, I spoke to Motor. He's an NYU professor. Uh, he's got a great website that has a lot of statistics that you can utilize. Uh, for multiples, things like that, at least to cross-check. So I just typed in his name, Demodra. Um I actually spelled his name wrong. D-A-M-O-D-A-R-A-N, his official site. And ah, he changed his website. Um, he has a section called Data, which has things that you can utilize. Ah, he changed his whole site. But he has things that you can utilize. Um, that could be used for um, to cap that formula, even just to cross-check multiples from a very high-level industry standpoint. So when you guys start to deal with, you might be dealing now with private companies, smaller private companies, especially if you're starting to work with Wyndham, you know, um, there you got to find public comps, or sometimes there aren't any comps, but you can look at multiples for the whole industry, just at least as a proxy. That's a good cross-check for you guys. So here, current data, risk and discount rates. If I click that, they give you betas by region, betas in different markets. Um, they give you tax rates in different regions, in different markets, which is helpful. Risk premiums and risk premium in the U.S. This is going to be good for our, our market risk premium. The way market risk premium is calculated, there's a company called Ibbotson. That, that's a, a paid, very expensive service. They're a consulting firm that takes the past 10 years of the S&P 500 returns, past 20 years, 30 years, all the way to 100 years, but each day they subtract it from what the, the risk-free rate was at that day to get the premium, and they average it out, and that's the market risk premium. The good news about market risk premiums is that banks pick a percentage, and they usually don't change it for at least a year or two. It's something that they look at every day. So I think the current market risk premium that's used is either five or six percent, and you would just use that for all your models. It wouldn't really change, um, unless you're in a really extreme circumstance, which I'll talk about later. But to look at what their risk premiums are, um, we can click. Let's see for other markets because this I think has the countries side by side. <clears throat> so you want to look at total. I think that, I think that's a total equity risk premium. I believe that's it. Yeah, equity risk premium, right here. Um, and if we go to the U.S., I believe it's all at the bottom. It's 
it's okay. He up it. It's five point seven five percent. So I would use that. I would just use five seven five. Real simple. But what's nice about this to know is if you're doing dealing with companies in other countries, here are the percentages that you can use. Obviously, the risk for the environment, the higher the percentage. So for the market risk premium, we'll use 5.75%. Um, there are other helpful things in here. This is a weird type of Internet Explorer that's very into Windows. And I don't know where it was back. I'm going to go back. Yeah. Uh, the betas, um, they have total cost of capital. If you're really struggling, calculating the WAC, they have WACs by industry in here. And also what's important is they have multiples. They have multiples. They have enterprise value, PE multiples, price to value, value to even, value to EBITDA. If you want to throw together quick comps or just a quick analysis, you can use these high-level multiples as a proxy. So great, great resource. Um, also, to get the treasury rate, I'll just do treasury rates. And that should pull up the daily treasury yield clerk rates by the treasury.gov, Department of Treasury. And you should get, it's funny, usually they give you a whole the whole table of all the rates. We we'll usually give the whole history, but okay, but just for now, you can get the history, I guess. So they're at 2.25% for 30 year. I like to do a 30 year analysis. 2.25%. So our risk free rate is 2.25%. U.S. Department of Treasury is where you get that. So for the model here, I would do risk free rate 2.25%, market risk premium 5.75%. But hold on, I want to I want to use the numbers in the book because this is a data analysis. That's where you get the information currently. At the time, the treasury rate was, it looks like I used 2.93. We used 2.93, so it went down a little bit. And the market risk premium at the time was 6. Now the beta, I'll show you how to calculate it. I'm going to send you a tab, we'll do it together. But usually most people just go either to Bloomberg or you go to finance.com, Yahoo Finance. And we'll go to Walmart. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal today about how a lot of these guest companies are cutting their share buybacks. Remember, and they spoke about the the reasons and the cash, the the, um, the reasons in relationship to the cash flow. Remember, I told you about the, the three in the cash flow statement. The three items that are based on cash availability, right? The three things that you would first look to cut if you're struggling: M&A activity share buybacks, and then dividends. Right? Dividends are the most detrimental because if you cut a dividend, it threatens the shareholders. Share buybacks are pretty bad too, right? Because it's just a, a public sign of, but in this case, when it's based reasons based on the commodity, you can't help it. But they had an interesting article about it, and, and I thought about our cash flow statement discussion. Um, so here's Walmart. This is where they're at. Let's hit the stock price popped. Um, I will go to key statistics. And there will be a table that will list the beta once we get there. <clears throat> so <coughs> once it works, there'll be a table on the right. That lists what the beta is, and what they had at the time. We'll talk about it. 
is 0 0.42. 0.42. What do you think about that? High, low, normal, expected. Oh, here, you know, here's the beta right here. I'm fine. I didn't realize they had right at the 0.29. They went even went down even lower. I don't remember. They, they, they restructured this. I don't remember beta being right up front. Key statistics gives you a little, a little more detail. But we'll use what was in the book. Either way, 0.42, 0.29. Is it high? Is it low? How do you, what do you think about that? Very low, less than less than 0.5, which means if the stock market rate increases by 10 percent, they would increase by point half of that. Right? Is that expected? It's one of the biggest in the SP 100, right? So I'm wondering how it ranks in terms of. But it's definitely one of the biggest. That is definitely a consumer box, right? It's it's like it's staples. I mean, not the same as the company, like yeah. consumer state. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't really expect it to move whether it's right. or not. Right. Or we've got you wouldn't expect it to have a lot of volatility, a company that size. So with this information, we can certainly calculate the cost of equity, which is going to be the risk-free rate, sorry, the, the beta times the market risk premium plus the risk-free rate. So 5.45% is a very low cost of equity. When you think about the cost of debt is 4%, that's unusually low. It, in certain situations, it might be lower than the cost of debt, which is, is, is unusual. Maybe that's too low. But let's move on. So what's the cost of debt? So the cost of debt is tough because I would, I would as a default, go to what's on their debt schedule. Now, they had 8.4% on their preferred, but 4.5% on the long-term debt. That's the, that's the bulk of their debt, the 4.5%. But a company this big that has public debt, remember I noted before, you want to get as current information as possible. You can go to research. You can go to Morningstar. What, I, what you can even do is just, just go to, um, if, if you don't know to go to Morningstar, you can just kind of go to search for Walmart debt, and they should pull up. Morningstar, and that would list its current tradable debts and the yields of those debts, which is pretty much as current as you can get. And so that should, here it is, list all their bonds outstanding, um, their bonds that most likely make up their long-term debts, and yeah, so 46 billion in bonds outstanding. We had about 44 billion long-term debt. There's their credit rating, and they should have a table of recent pieces of debts and what their yield is. There it is. It's gone down a lot. Jeez, 3.58 percent. There's the coupon. 5.25. Now, at the time in the book, I had used. I used the last bonds raised, which had a yield maturity of 5.625. I wondered if I was too conservative there, 5.625, because that's quite a high cost of debt. You add one minus tax to that, it's going to go down to like 3 or 4%. It would end up being lower than cost of equity, but it should be significantly lower. But again, Walmart is, is so stable, you know, it depends. Now, you also need to get a measure of the debt and equity outstanding. Now, we did this before, but just to remember, it's the equity value, not the book equity, but the, the public value um, or the current trading value based on the stock price based on diluted shares. What's the current value outstanding? And also, you want to try to get the most current value of debt. Now, we typically, Morningstar doesn't capture everything, so... Typically, I just took it from the balance sheet, right? The short net plus long term debt. No minority interest, the short net plus long term debt. The value of the debt, all in the capital leases, the value of all the debt outstanding. And we'll use that to quite create a weighted average. How do we create a weighted average? Well, there's, remember the formula, debt divided by debt plus equity times cost of debt, that's the debt average, times the tax rate. 
plus equity divided by debt plus equity times cost of equity. So it's the value of the equity divided by, in parentheses, debt plus equity. So that's the percentage of equity in the business. How much equity is out there? How much equity do they have? Times the cost of equity. Plus the debt divided by debt plus equity. So plus debt divided by debt plus equity. Times cost of debt, but times one minus the tax rate. I'm just going to pull the tax rate from the income statement. I believe in the book, well, whether I use 2012 and 13, it's the same thing, right? Or did I hard code 2013? Just want to make sure I match it exactly. <laughs> And that gives me 5.16. So, you know, the WAC obviously has to be lower than the cost of equity and then higher than the cost of debt. It is. I mean, cost of debt times one minus tax rate. So here when I said that 10% that we used was way too high, it was double than what it is listed to be here. But what are the variables here? We'll, we'll hone in on that. Okay. Now let's look. Remember that the problem here was that the EBITDA method was so much higher, almost double what the perpetuity method was. What happens when the WAC reduces? Let's take the 10% and link it into the 5.16. The new WAC now falls a lot more in line. 2 to the 310 at 5.16. And if we go down, so we have a, a target stock price of 88 to 97, it's high. And we'll, we'll work on that. But note this is where they're at now. This is, this is a year or two ago, right? Um, yeah. um, so, uh, about a method and then perpetuity method. So, how much the share price should be different like in, in the range? What's like a range? It depends. I mean, there'll be some situations where they're widely different. Let me put it this way, and now this is where I'm just going to go. Why is the EBITDA method less than the perpetuity method right now? So what's driving it? What is causing the EBITDA method to be slightly less than the perpetuity method? And, 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 and I don't mean even in this situation, just generally. What would cause the EBITDA method to be less? The multiple. Multiple could be down. Multiple could be low. Maybe your comps are undervalued. Right? What would cause the perpetuity method to be lower or higher? The growth rate. The which rate? The growth rate. The growth rate, although we're using one percent. But the growth rate, what else? Um, 
your your model projections. Yeah, so if you see, if you so the EBITDA method is, is largely based on the market, on the multiple. The perpetuity method has is is more based on your overall cash flow projections. So if you see a real disconnect in your EBITDA method and your perpetuity method, consider the multiple. Is your multiple off? Is your multiple wrong? Is your company really, really undervalued? Then you should use maybe the comps multiple. Is your company really, really overvalued? Then you should use the comps multiple. Um, and then if your perpetuity is way off, you also consider the growth in your model. Are you showing really, really high growth that might be, you know, a little unusual? Well, that would be a reason for it. So some of those reasons could be explainable, or some of those reasons could be highlighting things that are wrong with your model. So some situations, well, yeah, yeah, this company is a high growth mode, and maybe the market hasn't captured that growth, then yeah, your perpetuity is going to be higher than your EBITDA. So that, Tommy, that's kind of the answer to your question. Uh, I was going to say something else now, but I lost, I lost the thought. Um, but it's important to look at the to look at the two and, and compare them. And you know, it's not always going to match up, um, but it's important to understand that a disconnect is a disconnect between generally the market perception versus the project the perception in your model. Now, also what we've proven in Walmart, the other thing that can be the underlying major difference to the disconnect is the whack. Right? But, but all should relatively fall in line. If your model's projections fall in line with what the market believes, it should fall in line. And that's where you have a perfect analysis. Situations like in 2008, 2009, when I did this for all different companies, just in different trainings and stuff, it was consistent that the EBITDA method was much, much lower than the perpetuity method. Why? Stock markets were sunken. And the, in that type of situation, People were selling stocks, getting into bonds, yet companies' cash flows and models weren't changing. So that was a situation where companies were supporting high EPS, yet people just didn't want to be investing in the stock market. So wherever you see situations where the EBITDA method is significantly less than the perpetuity method, it's a good time to invest. Right? The company's cash flows are supporting a valuation that the market for some reason isn't seeing. So that's one good way to look at that. You know, and when I did this model, I did this with a lot of variables, several different ways, um, back when putting together the book. I mean, this was at maybe like 70, but the company's stock was at like 49.50. So it was so easy to determine that the company's over. Now it's a little bit difficult because this was kind of, we'll look at different variations, kind of where the stock market was. But there's some situations you'll see is clear cut. The stock needs to go up, and the only thing that's failing is market perception. That was a good time to invest, so that's what you can look for. Um, so even though we have a range of 88 to 97, um, there are major variables that could impact this. So using the EBITDA method, what are the two biggest variables that affect this? The two biggest variables. The two biggest variables that impact the EBITDA method. Like a part of the multiple. So. No, including the multiple. I'm just recapping. The multiple and market value. Not market value. In the model. The drivers. That would be maybe a second priority to this next one I'm thinking about. Nope. <laughs> you no, know, I mean, multiple drives EBITDA, drives the EBITDA terminal multiple, drives the EBITDA value, and what else? And the whack. So what would happen if the WAC increased a little bit? What would drive an increase in WAC? Cost of 
cost of debt, which probably won't shift too much, more what's more variable than that? <coughs> which is driven by what? Beta. Beta. Beta would might drive that. And the multiple will be impacted by the comps and the stock price and the value. So I think you mentioned stock price, but that's kind of baked in the multiple. So let's put together a, a, a variable data table. And it's important for you guys to know how to do that anyway. That would say, well, if the whack were to change or the multiple were to change, how would the stock price change? So this is called a two variable data table. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna title this table as EBITDA value, equity value. Meaning the equity value based on EBITDA. And I'm gonna have the variables be across the row, varying WAC. So we have what? We have 5.16%. I'm gonna say, what if the WAC I mean, I don't think the wax ever going to go down further, right? Although, actually, the beta did go down, right? The beta went down to 0.29, didn't it? Holy cow. All right. Let's say, what if the wax goes from 4%, 5%, oh, I should be doing this here, 6%. What if the wax goes 4%, 5%, 6%? How does it vary is what I'm trying to get to, right? In in valuation, you always go go for a range, never a specific number, because there's so much variability. So you want really upper and lower boundaries, and hopefully those upper and lower boundaries won't really be too. You know, you don't want the range to be too wide. But we're going to look at upper and lower boundaries for each method of valuation and see what this means for one. Underneath, I want very variability in the multiples. I'm going to look to the comps to help with that, but we didn't do the comps yet. So for now, let's say it was 8.7, let's say 8 times, 9 times, well, I can't use an X because I won't calculate, 8, 9, and 10. So a, this is a two variable data table where you have a set of variables that should impact the output along the row, a set of variables that should impact the output up and down the column, and then in the center we want the table populated with a certain output. I want to know how the stock price would change based on varying the whack and varying the multiple. So the first thing I do is have a link in the upper left corner of the table in from what I want the table to be populated with. So in the upper left corner, I'm, I'm going to have a link from the $88.60. So I, I ruined the highlight of my table, but that's okay. So this is the basic formula for a two-variable data table. And so this is going to tell me at a glance, based on varying these multiples, how the output would change, right? As opposed to, you could do this manually. I can do this manually by saying, all right, let me make the whack 4% and make the multiple 8%. And that's going to give me a number, and I hard coded it here. Let me make the WAC 5% and make the multiple 8%, that's going to give me a number. I'm going to hard code it here. But you don't want, this automates everything. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the whole table, and I'm going to go to data, what if analysis, if you guys have a different version of Excel, I still think it's data what if analysis, right? Yeah. Data, data, data table. the older Excel is data table, data table, yeah, the old, old Excel is data table, data table, or you can do alt DT, it also gets you there. Alt-DT. 
like alt then d then t, not all at the same time. Alt d t. What do you see, Lake? Sorry. Sorry? Yeah, they stock price. What did I do? Up here? You mean how to get this box? Yeah. Alt DT. Oh, you have an app? You know, you should do Alt DT. Oh, Alright, is that what you're asking? Yep. Thank you. So now it's got two input commands, the row input cell and the column input cell. The row input cell is saying, hey, of these variables in the row, where did it go in the model to impact those variables? Where, where in the model do we, do we have to, where in the, in the model are those variables adjustable? Where is it? So I know you know what I mean. Yes, but where? Yes, F17, right? This is where the variable gets adjusted. This could be 4, this could be 6. So you wouldn't do, uh, wouldn't do L16, whatever it is? The actual result of WAC? Um, Doesn't matter. You could. Could do that, but you have to make sure as long as this links into this and links through, right? It, it has to impact the answer, otherwise it won't give you cable. And the column input cell asks the same question, but for this multiple, it sees eight, nine, and ten. But where in the model does it go to change that? And that's this eight point seven. So if you hit OK, you should see the table, and I'll leave you guys with the formatting. Well, we can have a little. Do we have time for one? Maybe not today. Um, how the stock price can be changed if the WAC goes up and down. Let's analyze that. Does everybody have that? So if the WAC goes up, the value goes down. Does that make sense? Who can explain why would the value go down if the WAC goes up? It's going to cost more to get that money. It costs more to get that money. Discount rate's higher, present value becomes lower. Multiple goes up, the value goes up naturally because it's a higher EBITDA on the exit. So even though we've established the case in the EBITDA method that the stock could be $88, it could go down a little bit to $78, it could go up a little bit more. It depends on these two major variables. It depends on the beta, it depends on the comps. So the point is, when you're doing your DCF, you're never going to come to one specific number. You want to do a range. We're going to come up with a range of each method, and we want to tweak this. We'll do this at the end. I mean, let's just throw the numbers in. At the end, we're going to step back and analyze and look at all the ranges, maybe even tweak this further. Let's do the same thing as practice for the perpetuity method. So let's put down here perpetuity equity value. And I'm going to have a link in from what I want the table to be populated with, which is the $97.14. Perpetuity value. And then again to the right, let's use the same WAC variables for, or I guess I can just look at them above, four, five, six.
And then, what's the second variable? So again, growth. So we have 1% as the growth rate. These days it could be as low as 0.5%. It could be 1%. It could be 1.5%. Let's use those variables. And then again, we'll go to data, what if analysis, data table. Okay. Well, one good cell again is talking about the four, five, six percent. Where does it go in the model to change those percentages? That's the whack. Well, one good cell is F17. And the column of the cell, same thing. It's talking about the 0 0.5, the 1, the 1.5. Where does it go in the model to change the column of the cell? It's F27. How do you think this is going to impact the perpetuity? How does growth impact the perpetuity? Let's find out. So, it, so here, an increase in the WAC, of course, lowers the value. Same idea, bigger discount rate. Increase in the percentage, higher growth, the expectation increases. Almost to a point of, I mean, this is $168. This doesn't, isn't, doesn't make much sense here. Right. And that's... There are ways we can now this out further. Okay, so this is this is not even remotely possible right now. So I would eliminate four percent as the whack. I deal with five six, maybe five six seven. There are ways to kind of use logic to narrow this down a little bit. Or which I don't think that they'll ever be at one point five percent in this market. Maybe even go down to 0.25. There are ways that we'll tweak and adjust. But you know, generally, there's not much pointing to the stock going back down to fifty unless there's maybe a major decline in the expectations in the model. But that's the way to look at this. So the real important takeaway is just to understand the two methods, even to, first of all, to understand how the DCF comes together, to understand the two methods, the meaning of the two methods. A lot of um, interview questions based on the meaning of the two methods, the interpretation of the two methods, and the WAC. What's the WAC mean? How does the WAC apply? So the next exam is going to be based on all of this, which is in two or three weeks. It's literally a case study that someone gave me from a Goldman Sachs interview. I reworked it. Um, it's just a paragraph. Take the paragraph. You got to you got to make one of these. Put together DCF, two methods, perpetuity, EBITDA method. Come up with the value. Understand the whack. So there's going to be two parts to the test. Part one is Q&A, just know the formulas. There are a lot of formulas. What's the formula for WAC? What's the formula for cost of equity? What's the formula for, um, you know, uh, discounting? It's all really all it is. And then part two is going to be a paragraph. Um, and then you have to put together your own valuation of the company. It's a model. Very simple. 
Um, and this is important because if we'll go, we'll recap once we're done with this first round of interviews, we talked about like an overview of the four different parts of the first round of interview. If it ever gets technical in the first round, most of the time it's based on valuation DCF whack. So it's important to know that. Okay, I checked your exams last night, and you guys did pretty well. Most of you. Especially compared to the, the first day, so it's good. It shows me you're learning a lot. I didn't hand them back because I have to record them into my into the system. I'm going to do that today, and we'll hand them back tomorrow. But tomorrow we'll talk about comps, LTM, calendarization. We're going to do a comp on Costco. Um, and then we'll probably spend about the next day and a half on that. We'll do pressing transactions. And then early next week, we'll conclude the valuation of Walmart and get it to M&A. So you should start getting the M&A book if you don't have it. Okay, any questions?